The first one I'm going to do is four simple steps to healthier bees. Um, next. Before you take too many notes, if you want to go look this presentation up online, if you go to that, go to myfishfarms.com, there's a choice on the left hand side for presentations or this is a direct link that will get you there. Um, you can download this presentation and read it later for free. You can, you know, if you see some cool quotes here, you thought you missed something, you can go back and look at it, okay? Um, also, I did write a book. Unfortunately, shipping them all to Australia was a little more expensive than I wanted to get into, so usually I'd have a bunch of books for sale, but they're available on all the online booksellers. Um, but I want you to understand it's all free on my website. You can go read it for nothing. Um, but people kept bugging me to write a book, so I put it in the form of a book. But it's the same basic material as what's on my website for free. I know that doesn't make me the greatest salesman, but um, <laughs> just want you to know that. So you won't be disappointed. You buy it and you go, well, this is just what's on his website. Well, yes, that's true. Um, okay, next. Um, this, this may be a little uh, far trip for some of you, but I actually I have people coming from all over the world. But I, I have a bee camp. I like to call it my Tom Sawyer bee camp. How many of you have ever read the book Tom Sawyer? Um, Tom Sawyer gets a bunch of people to um, paint the fence for him, and they pay him to paint the fence. Well, I want you to come and pay me to do my bee work, and um, you can stay two weeks in a teepee at my house or at the hotel down the road if you want. And... Um, Hopefully you'll learn a lot about bees in the process. But um, anyway, that runs for two weeks. It's like the middle of May, like the 20th of May to the first part of June. You can get details there if you're interested. Next. So let's talk about four simple steps for healthier bees. My first step is no treatments. Um, next. Now that sounds kind of contradictory, but let's talk about why. Um, I think beekeepers and, and bee scientists for the last 150 years at least have made the mistake of assuming that a bee colony is just a bunch of bees. Um, and they haven't taken into account that it's an entire ecology. If you ever go take a, a hive out of a tree, you'll find things living in the detritus at the bottom of the colony. You'll find things, if you, especially if you were to look at them with a microscope, that live on the bees. and things that live in the bee bread and things that live in the honey and things that live in the gut of the bee. Um, there are, I used to say 40 because that was the number. There are 40 kinds of mites that live on bees. Well, actually, somebody questioned that, and so I went and looked it up and found out there's actually 170. I was quoting a number that I got from one of the bee scientists in the U.S., and that's probably how many mites are on the bees in the U.S., I, I would guess. But there's actually 170 mites that live on bees, and there's only really three of them that are a problem, and and uh, you're lucky enough not to have most of them here. Um, and hopefully that will continue. I wish you good luck. <laughs> but so far they seem to show up on ships and things at places like Hawaii that didn't used to have them. So you may someday have to worry about them. I hope you don't. But most of those aren't a problem, and they live on the bees and probably fill a niche in that ecology that may displace some of the other bees. In fact, a couple of those mites we know eat varroa mites. But... Um, we don't really know how many, we don't know how big of an impact they have, but we do know they eat varroa mites, uh, a couple of them. There's probably over 30 kinds of insects that live in a typical colony in a tree, um, and not counting other things that, other things like centipedes, and, and I don't know what all you have that live here. You have things that live here that don't live anywhere else, so I wouldn't know what lives in one here. But um, there's over 8,000 kinds of microorganisms that live in bees that they've managed to isolate and culture. Um, next. If you want to look up uh, a reference to that, um, if you go to that site right there, uh, the USDA has a, a little blurb on those 8,000 microorganisms, and it's based on, and they say so, that it's based on Martha Gilliam's research. And if you'd like to read Martha Gilliam's research on those 8,000 microorganisms, um, that was done back in the 80s. Um, it's available on this website. You can go look at those studies on all those 8,000 microorganisms that live in a bee colony. This is a healthy bee colony. These aren't pathogens. These are, these are things that live in a healthy bee colony. Next. So what happens if you treat 
Now, I don't know what the laws are in Australia. They, there's a lot of treating done in the U.S. and most of Europe, the European Union and a lot of other places. A lot of these treatments are illegal, which they should be. But um, I don't know what all is legal here. Um, Fumadil is a popular one in America, and they use it to try and kill Nosema. Uh, the fact that it causes birth defects is why most of the European Union won't let you use it. Um, not sure why somebody wants to put that in a bee colony and have it possibly end up in the honey, but uh, people in the U.S. use it. It kills uh, quite a few microorganisms, particularly it's targeted at, at uh, microsporidia and fungi, but it actually also kills some uh, bacteria. Teramycin, of course, is, is a popular one to, that they use to treat for AFB in the U.S. Um, I think that's illegal here, if I remember right. Um, and, and again, I think it should be uh, the right way to treat AFB is to burn the hive and move on because the spore, this won't kill the spores. This will only kill the active bacteria, not the spores, and so you really haven't solved your problem. Um, but the biggest problem is that it kills off the bacteria in their gut that protects them from AFB. So you actually end up causing the thing you're trying to protect them from. Fumadil is the same way. It's killing off the bacteria in their gut that protects them from Nosema. And um, so you're into, you're, again, you're causing the very thing you're trying to prevent. Um, essential oils seem to be a popular thing to treat. You know, things like wintergreen oil, tea tree oil, um, thymol, uh, menthol, those are all essential oils. Um, they seem to be popular in the U.S. for a lot of things, including varroa mites, but also um, tracheal mites, and they use them for in general to try and prevent things like Nosema. But again, they kill off a lot of those 8,000 microorganisms. Organic acids are real popular to fight uh, Varroa again, and that's formic acid, oxalic acid are the two big ones, and again, they kill almost all the, or all the microorganisms. The caricides, I hope you don't ever have to worry about these, but they, keep, they, they uh, contaminate the wax with basically what used to be an insecticide that they relabeled as an acaricide to kill the mites. Um, and, and again, it's going to upset that whole ecology. Next. You may not treat much around here, so maybe this one isn't the, big, the best point I've got. Um, but let's talk about the beneficial organisms and, and whether an organism is, is beneficial or a pathogen or, or it's just benign. Basically, anything that's just benign is probably beneficial just because it crowds out things that are pathogens. Uh, it fills a niche in that ecology. When you, I, I, you guys have EFB here, I assume? You have, you have chalk fruit here? Yeah. Well, I don't know what's happened here, but when chalk fruit showed up in the U.S., EFB almost disappeared. And then it's kind of made a comeback in just the last few years, and I'm not sure why. I don't know what changed in the last few years of how the beekeepers are treating their bees or what, but, um, but it had almost disappeared once the chalk brood showed up because chalk brood actually, the spores actually prevent EFB. Um, I'm not suggesting you try to get them. I'm just saying that there, there's actually this balance. And as long as the chalk brood spores aren't enough to cause chalk brood, they're probably preventing EFB. Um, there are bacteria in the gut of the bee that protect them from EFB and AFB. Um, Stone brood uh, toxin is basically what fumadil is, which they're using to try to kill Nosema. And that stone brood is, is, a, is another disease sort of like chalk brood that the bees can get. Um, and again, that kind of prevents Nosema. And if it doesn't get bad enough to cause stone brood, it may actually be preventing Nosema. At the same time, it's not causing stone brood. Um, there's recent uh, information that this these bacteria that live in the gut of the bee actually create a film in the gut that protects them from other things like Nosema and AFB and EFB. In fact, the way it protects them from AFB and EFB, they just came out with a study within the last year that uh, what happens is that when the nurse bee is feeding the larva and they have these beneficial bacteria, that beneficial bacteria gets fed to the larva and it triggers the larva's immune system. And then when the larva's immune system is triggered, they don't get EFB or AFB. And if it doesn't get triggered by that, then it gets exposed to AFB or EFB, then they get AFB or EFB. So by trying to treat for AFB or EFB by using antibiotics, you create the problem you're trying to prevent. Um, 
yeasts and bacteria are necessary for the formation of bee bread. Um, basically, you know, most of us have this idea that bees eat pollen. They don't actually. They collect pollen and they make bee bread. It's sort of like say, saying they eat pollen is like saying that somebody who eats sauerkraut all the time eats cabbage. Well, they sort of eat cabbage, yes. They eat cabbage that's been processed into something else. And they eat pollen, which has been processed into bee bread, and they need to process it in order to be digestible. I think some of the recent problems in the U.S. are now being tracked to the fact that the farmers have suddenly started using a lot of fungicides, and the fungicides are getting hauled back to the hive, and the people spraying them aren't concerned about whether or not the bees get exposed to them because they think they won't kill bees. And the bees haul back the pollen that now has fungicide on it, and it won't ferment, and it kills off all the bacteria and yeast, especially the yeast, that, that they need in order to ferment the bee bread. And now the, the young are undernourished because they can't, they can't get the, nu the nutrients from it because it's not fermented. Um, so some of that isn't just the beekeepers treating. Some of that's actually some of what's being sprayed on the, on the plants now. Next. Um, this is a study you can find online. They actually have the whole study available for free if you want to search for symbionts as major modulators of insect health. This isn't the most recent one on the topic. It's the one where they first talk about a biofilm in their gut. The more recent one is the one I mentioned where they figured out that it was, it was the beneficial bacteria that was triggering the immune system. That's an interesting one. Um, I don't have it listed up here, but it, it's... Uh, it's the one I mentioned at the bottom of the page there. Next. Um, again, let's talk more specifically about benign organisms. You have, you have an organism that lives on your skin that, that is basically staph. Uh, and if it didn't live on your skin, you'd have fungus living on your skin. And if you had fungus living on your skin, you would have problems. The fact that you have bacteria living on your skin is a good thing. So is staph a beneficial organism? Well, not if it gets in a cut and it starts living in a cut, then it's a pathogen. But as long as it's living on your skin, it's a beneficial organism. And I think a, you'll find a lot of things in a bee colony are benign in the sense that they're not causing any problems, but they're actually beneficial in the sense that they're filling a niche, just like that staph on your skin fills a niche so that the, bat, so that the fungus doesn't live on your skin. Um, the, a lot of these bacteria and other yeasts and fungi that are living in a colony are filling a niche in this ecology. Next. So my, my next reason for no treatments is that we need to put selective pressure where it belongs. Next. Um, if you want to raise bees that don't require treatments, I think the first thing you have to do is stop treating them, and that way you can determine that they're capable of living without treatments and being healthy. I don't understand how you think you can raise bees that don't require treatments when you keep treating them. Um, what you need to do is, ra is raise bees from the bees that are succeeding at, at surviving well. O oddly enough, though, maybe what we're really selecting for, we think we're selecting for the genetics of the bees, and we may actually be selecting for the genetics of the microbes that live in the colony. That may be the whole reason that they're healthy is the microbes that are in the colony. And we think we're breeding from this queen who has these wonderful genetics, but actually we're breeding from a colony that happens to have really good bacteria and fungi and yeasts living in it. Um, but whatever the case, if we don't stop treating, we really won't be able to select the ones that are doing well. Um, next. Now, you, again, you probably don't have to deal with the Varroa, but part of the problem with treating in Varroa is you keep killing off the Varroa, um, and so the only Varroa that survive are the ones that can reproduce so fast that they can keep up with you trying to kill them off all the time. And so you end up breeding a super parasite and a weaker bee, and that's a bad combination. Um, next. My... Third reason is to keep the, the combs clean of chemicals. Um, again, you're not, you're not dealing with Varroa so much here, but you may be sometime in the near future. Um, next. We, 
the, the stuff they're using for acaricides are lipophilic and they soak into the wax. That's also true of, of essential oils. Most of them are oils, so therefore they build up in the wax. Um, and the more we have things build up in the wax that don't really belong in a beehive, the more we create, up, we create problems. Next. Um, my next reason is that the chemicals interfere with the natural communication of the hive, which is by smell. Next. Um, be, honeybees have 165 odorant receptor genes. That's twice what a fruit fly has, and it's twice what a mosquito has. And a mosquito can smell you about 200 yards away and find you just, you know, no problem. Um, honeybees in a colony are co doing a lot of their communication by smell, by pheromones. A lot of the feedback mechanisms in a colony are by, are by, are by pheromones. And when you put uh, really strong essential acids in there, some of those essential acids actually duplicate almost identical to some of those pheromones. Um, and some of them are just covering up the smells of what's going on in a colony. Uh, but I think putting anything in there that interferes with the smell, which would mostly be essential oils, um, I think you're having an effect on their ability to communicate. Next. Um, you, you, you don't get this, this sermon I get all the time. I, I keep getting this sermon that if I, you don't treat all your bees, you're going to die. Um, I don't know why people keep telling me that. I, I was on an interesting panel in, at, the, at an Ohio State meeting, and there was a guy to my right who's been a treatment tree beekeeper for 15 years at least. And there's me, and then there's a couple of the bee scientists, and then there's a guy who's working for one of the chemical companies selling some treatment for Varroa, and then there's a couple other really natural thinking people beside that. And we're having this discussion, and, and the, one of the scientists, well, the guy who's selling the Varroa treatment, basically says that if you stop treating it, maybe that all the bees will die, and none of them will survive. And the guy next to me says, but that's just ridiculous. Why do you say that? You know I haven't treated in 15 years, and my bees didn't die. And you know Michael hasn't treated in at least 15 years. His bees haven't died. So why do you say that? But there seems to be an insistence that all your bees are going to die. I don't really, you know, again, you're not dealing with the Varroa, but basically I'm not losing any more hives than anybody else. I'm losing hives. Everybody loses hives, and the Varroa have made it harder to keep bees, there's no doubt. And you are fortunate you don't have to worry about that. Next. Um... Yeah, you're, you're not doing, dealing with row. I'll just skip this. Next. Um, I think this is important. Anywhere you are, I think you should be reading from the local bees that are surviving on their own and doing well in your climate. Uh, bringing in bees from other climates isn't tel helpful. Now, I don't know how your bee industry works. We have a lot of packaged bees, and they tend to come from either the Deep South or California, and they're not very acclimatized to Nebraska, where I live, and most of them don't make it through the winter. Um, I have much better luck if I raise local bees that live in a local area. And I don't think, some of it's the ability to survive winter, but some of it also is just the ability to, to make the right decisions for when the flows are where you live. And if they make the wrong decisions, see bees are all gamblers, they make the wrong decisions, they may starve to death because they may raise too many bees at the wrong time and then there's nothing to feed them. Um, it, bees are all gamblers, they have to they have to gamble on how many bees are we going to raise before this main flow hits so that we can put away all this food so that we'll have enough food for later. And if they make that decision correctly, then they build up before the main flow hits and then they gather a lot of food on the main flow and then they kind of let the population dwindle down when the flow's over. Um, if they make that decision wrong and they raise way too many bees way too early, then they starve to death because there's too many mouths to feed and there's nothing to, eat, nothing to eat. Or if they make it too late, then they build up on the flow until there's way too many bees. And after the flow's over, there's too many bees, too many mouths to feed, and they starve to death. So the bees that live in your area are more attuned to your flows. You know, they build up at the right times to, to take advantage of those. Um, next. So you need them adapted to your climate. You need... Uh, them to be survivors who are challenging, who are meeting whatever challenges you have. If those challenges are small hive beetles or those challenges are AFB or whatever that's out there in the world, you want the ones that are not having problems with those things. Um, 
The other reason you want to raise your own queens is that you can raise them at an optimum time for nutrition and plenty of drones out there for them to get bred to. Um, you, can, you can raise really poor queens from really good genetics. If they're not well fed and they're not well bred, they won't make very good queens. If they're well fed and well bred, you can raise really good queens from mediocre genetics. I'm not saying you should try to find mediocre genetics. Obviously, you should try to find really good genetics. But really good genetics that are really well fed and really well bred will be way better queens. But even mediocre genetics that are well fed and well bred will be, will be pretty good queens. Um, so if you raise queens at a time, you, you may not have this problem so much as I have in the United States. <clears throat> Our queen breeders are trying to breed queens earlier and earlier because the beekeepers keep demanding them, and so they raise them in March. In, and, and March is way too early where they're raising them to have enough drones to get them bred well. Um, the other thing is if you raise your own queens and you don't cage them at all or you cage them after they've been laying for a little while, their ovarials develop better. When a queen first starts to lay, her ovarials just start to develop. And the longer she lays before she gets interrupted, the more they develop. But as soon as you stop her from laying and put her in a cage, they quit developing and they never finish developing once you interrupt that. So what happens is people who are breeding queens and selling them usually uh, put a queen cell in there and as soon as the queen's laid an egg or two, they stick her in a cage and bank her and then they ship her to whoever later. Um, and those, that ovarial development gets interrupted. So if you're going to raise your own queens and you leave them in the mating nuke until you're ready for them and then you just introduce them to the hive, and you don't interrupt that ovarial development. Or you raise some queen cells and put them in your hives to requeen them and they emerge into the hive in the first place and they never get interrupted, they're going to make better queens. Next. Um, so of course you're going to save money by not buying queens, but it's You'd be surprised how much it'll change your beekeeping knowing you have queens available. It's a whole other ball game when I have to find somebody who has a queen. Then I have to get them to ship it to me. And then it turns out maybe I didn't even need a queen because uh, maybe there was a virgin running around in there and it turns out they killed that queen and whatever. And I just spent $40 on nothing. When you've got queens available, you can make different decisions as a beekeeper because you go, oh, I got a queen. I can put her in there. Uh, maybe they'll kill her. Maybe they won't. But I've got plenty of queens because it's no big, you know, I'm raising queens. Um, it kind of changes how you see it because you've got, you got spare queens around. Uh, I think it, you, you, won't, you won't be contributing to the overall genetic diversity of the honeybees in North America, but um, you, might be con you might be contributing to the overall genetic diversity of the honeybees in Australia if you raise your own queens from the local queens that are here rather than bringing in queens from someplace else. Next. Um, next. Um, next, some of this will go quick, huh? Natural food, let's talk about that. This is actually pollen down here. You can see all the different variations in here. There's different amino acids and different pollens. Next. Um, and, and basically what I'll say about pollen is this. I don't quite understand the pollen substitute thing. I don't know what it's like here because I'm not, I'm not in your beekeeping scene here, but um, it seems to have become a very popular thing for uh, new beekeepers who are buying packaged bees to buy pollen patties. These, they call them pollen patties, but there's no pollen in them. They're pollen substitute patties to put in the colony, even though they're putting this package in at a time when there's plenty of real pollen available. Well, pollen substitute makes short-lived bees. If you want short-lived bees, then I guess pollen substitute's a great idea. But what really happens is um, you buy this package of bees, you put this pollen substitute in, and they don't even eat it because there's real pollen out there and they know the difference. So they go get the real pollen that's really good nutrition and they leave the pollen patties for the small hive beetles who love them. Um, so really they should just relabel these pollen substitute patties as small hive beetle food and, and sell them that way. That's my opinion. But um, let's talk a little about the pH of honey and the pH of syrup. Um, there's probably other things in honey besides pH that are an issue here. There's, you know, if, I, I've never understood the argument that beekeepers make that honey and, and sugar are just as nutritious. If you really believe that, then why don't you just buy sugar, make sugar syrup, and feed it to your family all the time instead of honey? Because obviously you think they're equivalent nutritionally, right? Um, 
obviously for beekeepers, I would assume we think that honey is a little better for you than sugar syrup, but making the assumption that sugar syrup is better for bees than honey doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but honey's got a lot of other things in it. it. It's got certain amino acids, it's got, it's got enzymes in it, it's got a lot of other things besides what I'm talking about, but let's just talk about this one thing for the moment. Sugar syrup has a higher pH. Uh, pH is sort of a measurement of alkalinity, not really a measurement of acidity, but the smaller the number, the more acidic it is, the higher the number, the, the more alkali it is. So basically sugar syrup's neutral, honey's a little bit acidic. So honey's about 3.2 to 4.5, sugar is 6.0. If you go look at how to uh, culture any of the bee diseases, the pathogens that cause these diseases, you know, the, the bacteria that causes AFB, the bacteria that causes EFB, the, the fungus that causes uh, chalk brood, um, the fungus that causes nosema. If you want to culture any of those, you culture them at 6.0 because they don't culture very well at 4.5. They don't culture for beans at 4.5, but they culture really well at 6.0. Um, next. So... Uh, so that's basically what I said there. Next. So uh, how much does that change in pH affect not only um, the, the, the general ability of all those pathogens to grow, but the other 8,000 microorganisms that are in the colony? Um, when in Martha Gilliam's research, she sees a difference just when the nectar changes between the proportion of these bacteria that live in the colony but they're still all living, but there'll be less of these and more of these as the nectar changes pH. Now you're gonna change the pH to something that's just optimal for all the diseases that bees get by feeding them sugar syrup. I don't think that's a good plan. Now, do I feed them sugar syrup? Yes, if I think they're gonna starve, I feed them. Um, I don't have any problem with that concept, but my plan is to manage them so that I don't have to feed them. That's my plan, and I don't, how well I succeed at that depends on that year and the weather and whatever happens. I don't know how that'll happen. It's always better to feed them than let them starve. If all you got to feed your kids is Twinkies, then you feed them Twinkies, but that's not the best thing to feed them. But, but you're not gonna let them starve if that's all you, all you can manage. Probably sugar syrup is the best thing you can come up with to feed bees if, you don't have, if they don't have enough honey. But um, I don't think it's the best thing to feed them. Next. Um, this is the typical argument for why you should steal all the honey and feed them back sugar syrup, is the price of sugar and the price of honey. Well, okay, but let's at least be let's at least be a little more honest and admit that we're spending more money harvesting that extra honey, uh, and and more time, and we're spending more time and money making all that syrup and buying all that sugar, and then we got to go out and feed it, and then we set off a bunch of robbing, and then we got to deal with the ants that came because we were feeding. And then if you take all of that effort and all that time into account, then I don't think you're saving as much money as you think you are. Uh, but you're probably still making a little more money. Um, but still, I think you ought to be honest about how, that, how much extra work you had to put into that. Um, next. So the upside of leaving honey and not trying to feed sugar syrup, as far as, you know, you don't have a winter. Maybe this doesn't even affect you. You know, I have winter. I gotta leave them some honey to get through the winter. Um, and I, if I leave them honey, I get less robbing and less drowning and less work and less trips to the bee yard, less brood diseases, and I don't mess with the ecosystem in the hive. Next. Um, let's talk about natural comb. Next. Um, you don't have row up, and I'm gonna skip over this somewhat, but the um, fact is it's, it was the tipping point for me on dealing with Varroa. But ignoring Varroa, um, the fact is we've upsized the bees. Next. Um, a guy named Bedeau came up with this wonderful idea that you could come up with a bigger bee by raising it in a bigger cell. Huber actually experimented with this back in the 1700s. He just didn't have foundation to play with in order to pull it off. He tried to raise workers and drone cells to see if they would end up bigger, but the bees just refused to do it. Eventually, um, when we got foundation, Bedeau stretched the foundation to make it bigger and kept making the bees bigger. Uh, a bee raised in a bigger cell ends up bigger in three dimensions. So if you increase the diameter of the cell uh, significantly, you actually increase the depth of the cell as well because the bees will draw that cell deeper. 
And so you end up increasing the size of the bee in three dimensions, and you end up with a bee that's 150% of the size that it would have been naturally. Um, so the standard foundation tends to be about 5.4 millimeters. Natural comb for workers tends to run somewhere between 4.4 and 5.1, and it varies. It's usually a variation of all of those. It's not all one thing or the other thing. Um, next. If you want to look at some recent research on this, there seem to be a lot of people denying that this is true. Um, there's plenty of historic references you can look at here. Um, there's actually a, um, this is a recent one on the fact that it enlarges the honeybees. They're basically reproducing some of uh, Bedeau's work because there seemed to be some question whether or not they actually made the, the cell size actually makes them bigger. Um, next. Let's make a couple of assumptions. I think these are fair assumptions. Let's assume that the bees know what natural cell size is, and that if we let them, they can answer that question. Um, and I think it's a reasonable assumption that the size they're going to build naturally is the right size. And I know there are some people who just assume that we can do better than Mother Nature, but I find that usually backfires. That's my opinion. But next. So. Um, what are the advantages of doing natural comb? Well, I think it's a lot less work. But one of the big advantages is you, you get clean wax. And you get natural sized bees. Now, will natural sized bees be healthier? Well, in my experience, I, I say yes. Um, is there any evidence to prove that? That's, that's difficult to come up with because nobody seems real interested in the overall effect of that. But um, a bee that's the size it was meant to be, I think is going to be healthier than a bee that's been artificially enlarged to be half again its normal size. If, if you were a, a human being and your normal weight would be 100 pounds and I figured out a way to make you 150 pounds, do you think I've improved your health? Probably not. I probably didn't do you any favors. Um, next. So natural comb is really the only way to get clean wax when you consider that the, the beeswax supply in the world is contaminated with all these chemicals. Um, so the only other way to get clean wax besides that is if you get a press and you make your own foundation. And if, you, if any of you have ever even watched the process, it wears me out just watching somebody do it. And I've actually done some of the work to do it, and it's, it's exhausting. Um, so I think the simplest way is just to let them build their own comb. Next. Um, the contaminated wax, I, you know, I don't know how your wax supply and our wax supply and the rest of the world's wax supply all interchanges. I don't know. But ours is all contaminated. They've done research on our foundation in recent years, and it's all contaminated with amitraz, fluvalinate, kumafos, and all of those contribute to infertile queens, infertile drones. They cause the queen to not live nearly as long. In fact, the... A lot of estimates are that the typical queen is getting superseded three times a year now. Um, and it's, there's, there's a research paper that I know of that's going to get published soon that says that it actually shortens the lives of the workers by about a week. So, and if you shorten the life of a worker by about a week, that's a huge impact on the colony. Because if you think about it, this bee gets, it emerges, it works as a nurse bee, it works as a house bee, it works, you know, so on and so forth. It finally starts to forage. The first two weeks, it's probably just hauling in enough food to raise the bees that replace the bee that's doing the work, you know? And then that last week is when it's actually making a profit. Well, if you take that last week off, there is no profit. There's no, there's no putting anything away as a surplus because you just, you cut their life off enough that there's, there's no, there is no surplus. Um, next. So how do you get natural comb? Um, this is one of the easiest ones. I'll pass this around. You can, uh, you can all take a look at it and pass it around. But this is, your this is your standard frame with a groove top, and it just has a wooden strip in it. And you can take a look at this. But basically, the strip gives them an edge from which to draw a comb. And they like to draw it from an edge. And this makes an edge. So they'll tend to cluster here. And then the edge will be in the middle, and they'll start drawing comb off of that edge. So there's no guarantees what bees will do, but they don't mess this up much, much more often than they mess up anything else. I'm going to pass that around. Um, 
some other ways you can do it. I don't know what you call everything here. You know, you, um, we have what we call a wedge top frame where there's a wedge here and you break it out and then you put, uh, you put in foundation and then you nail it back in to hold the foundation in. Well, if you break that wedge out instead of, instead of nailing it back in the same way, don't put any foundation in it. You turn it sideways and you nail it back in so it sticks down, you'll have an edge that they'll draw from. And uh, I, you just saw the grooved one there. You can, um, I don't know what you call them here either. When you buy them at a craft store in the States, they call it a jumble craft stick, but it looks like a tongue depressor to me. I don't know what you'd call it here. It's a little wider than a typical popsicle stick, um, but you can get about two and a half of those and glue them in that groove and they work pretty well. And then you don't have to run a table saw to cut the, the little strips. And I don't recommend you do that unless you're good at running a table saw because cutting little thin strips on a table saw is a tricky proposition. But if you're good at it, it that, that's a fine way to do it too. Um, you, you can cut strips of foundation to put in there. The reason I don't like that very much is that if the wax moths ever eat it up, and I have to scrape it all off, I have to clean that groove out and, and wax another strip in there, and that means I gotta take it back to the house and clean it up. When I'm out in an out yard and it's a wood strip like the one I'm passing around here, then I just scrape all the, all the old wax off and put it back in, and I don't have to take it back to the house to clean it up. Um, so it's a little more permanent from my point of view, but um, another thing you can do is just, you can take a chamfer molding or cut a corner off of a, um, Jeez, you know, I, I don't know what size that is in metric. Um, three, it's a three-quarter inch board. If you cut the corner off, you end up with a chamfer molding that's as wide as that top bar and has a point on it, and you can put that on the bottom to make a V-shaped um, comb guide. All of those work. Uh, people are always asking me which one I like the best, and I always say, well, it depends on what frame I have in my hand. If I've got one that has a groove in it, then I like the popsicle sticks or a piece of strip of wood in it. If I've got um, if I've got a wedge frame, then I prefer to turn the wedge. I, you know, I, I use whatever I've got in my hand, but um, probably if I'm making them from scratch, I kind of like the V shape, but they, they follow all of them pretty well. It's not, it doesn't matter that much. Next. This is a picture of it with the V shape. Um, that's actually a V right there. I bought these from Walter T. Kelly, which is a company in the U.S., and I just told them I wanted a thousand of them, and I didn't want a groove here, and I didn't want a groove here. And they wouldn't cut the bevel for me, but they sold me the frames, and then I cut the bevels. But, um, so that's the kind with the bevel on it. The one I'm passing around here is the kind with this wood strip in it, and they both work fine. Next. This is a drawn foundationless frame. You'll see it's attached here. It's kind of open here, and it's attached through here, and it's kind of open here. And it's kind of open here, and people are always saying, can you uh, extract them? Well, this is it just before I extracted it. Now, if this comb, you see this comb is kind of yellow. If this comb was all white and soft, then it would make really good comb honey, and it wouldn't extract very well. So I'd cut it up for comb honey. Uh, but since it's nice and yellow like this, I uncap it and extract it. It extracts just fine. Um, the really soft wax does not extract just fine. Even if it's on wax foundation, it doesn't extract very fine because it's just really soft. Um, when bees first make beeswax, they, they take that piece of wax that they, we're calling it wax, we take that thing that they eventually turn into beeswax that, that they, ex, they exude on their belly and they pull that little piece off and they chew it up and it's kind of a hard piece of wax. They chew it up and turn it into, and mix it with some kind of saliva stuff that makes it into this putty-like stuff that they can shape into comb. And they shape it into comb. And if there's a strong flow on, then they just fill it full of honey and cap it with that same soft wax. And then they move on because they don't have time right now. Eventually, if they get time, they'll come back and they'll paint this with something else that's another kind of excretion from their mouth. And they'll paint it with that and it gives it that yellow tint and it makes it tough. It makes it hard. It changes it. it it's like it sets the that putty into a harder substance. Um, so if it's got that yellow tint to it, it's usually plenty tough and it extracts just fine. And if it doesn't, it makes really good comb honey and I just cut it for comb honey. Next. Um, so one of the questions is always, can I wire them? Well, I'm running all mediums and, and I don't really have to wire them. Um, uh, if I was running deeps, I might think about it. 
I don't like wiring them because I like to be able to cut them up for comb honey. Um, can I extract them? Yeah, you can extract them. Um, won't they just build drones if you do natural comb? Well, they'll build, they, they have a quota they're trying to meet for drone comb, and a quota they're trying to meet for drones, the quota they're trying to meet for drones kind of varies throughout the year. It kind of peaks in the spring and it drops off in the fall, uh, but um, once they meet their quota, they're going to stop doing that. If you keep pulling the, their drone comb out, then they'll never meet their quota and they'll never stop doing that. So you need to leave that drone comb in there, put it on the outside, two outside frames and not worry about it. Well, they mess them up. I think they'll mess up anything. Um, they'll mess up foundation, they'll mess up foundationalists, but they might not mess up any of it. It's hard to say. I don't think they mess it up any more often, but when it's foundationless, once they mess up one comb and it's running crossways of the frames, then every other, every, all the rest of the combs are gonna be parallel to that comb. And so they may mess up the whole box. Um, so you wanna keep an eye on it if you're gonna do foundationless. And it's helpful if you can pull a drawn comb up and put in the middle of that box to kind of get them going in the right direction because they build parallel combs. And if you put a nice straight one in there, they tend to build them parallel to that. Mm -hmm.